Okay, welcome to this talk about advanced drawing techniques using UI Bezier Path and Apple Pencil. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Nick Dalton. I'm an independent iOS and Mac developer. And before we dive into this talk, let me get a show of hands. How many of you have already used UI Bezier Path in your code at some point? Oh, that's great. How many of you have or feel comfortable with the math behind Bezier curves? Okay, excellent. <laughs> Good thing I prepared some slides about that. So you probably come across Bezier curves uh, if you use a vector drawing program. You know you draw these lines and then you have these control points that you drag and sometimes expected things happen with your curve and more often than not, at least in my experience, unexpected things happen. Kind of like this little graph here you see here where the curve goes off in certain unexpected directions. So let's try to figure out what's actually going on with these control points and these paths. So what we're talking about here is vector graphics. And vector graphics are great because they're scalable, which is uh, great when Apple keeps throwing new screen resolutions at us. And they're very compact in the representation. So if you want to store the vector graphics in the file compared to a bitmap representation, vectors are great. So if we have a trivial example here, a straight line, we can represent that by the starting x and y coordinates and then the end x and y coordinates. And we can have other simple geometrical figures like rectangles, circles, things like that. Those are very easy to represent uh, using coordinates, maybe a radius for a circle, etc. But what, what do you do when you have a vector curve like this? How can we describe this in a vector format? Well, maybe we know the exact formula. And that's great if we know the formula, we can then plot it. But going the other way around, maybe we just have the points on the curve on the screen because the user has just drawn it on the screen. How do we figure out what the formula is? That's a non-trivial problem and fairly compute intensive. We don't want to do that in real time, especially if we're in a drawing program. Another approach is we can try to approximate the curve using straight lines. And we can keep adding more line segments to get closer and closer to the curve. Uh, but at some point, this is going to look like a bitmap again. We're going to have so many line segments that we're back to bitmap problem. So what do we do? Imagine that you're standing here at the green little point and you're throwing an object into the air. And you're throwing it at an angle represented by this red arrow and you're applying force represented by the length of that arrow. Now if you know those things, you know your starting point, you know the vector for how you're throwing this object, you can plot the course of this object. Uh, you need to know know a few more things. You have a gravity vector, which is constant. Uh, you probably have some air resistance. That's why the curve is not symmetrical. Um, as an aside, this is actually what the very first computers were used to do, was to calculate uh, projectile paths like this. So this is a great way to represent, with very little information, again, it's like a vector, vector graphics, a very complex curve. Now if we take this red vector line, or arrow, and we change it to make it a coordinate up at the top, that little gray box at the top. Now all of a sudden this starts looking like very much like one of those control points that we had in our Bezier curves, and that's exactly what it is. This line here follows the tangent of the blue line, which is the angle that you started your throw in. So that perfectly describes the beginning part of this curve. What about the end part? In our graphics drawing program, we probably don't have gravity and we certainly don't have air resistance. Um, so what we'll do instead, we'll change those two vectors into another control point. And with these two control points, we can perfectly draw and describe, uniquely describe this path. 
So all we need is four coordinates in this case. The starting coordinate, that's the green dot, the end coordinate, the red dot, and then we have those two squares which are called control points in Bezier curves. So this is what's called a cubic Bezier curve. It's got two control points. Another variation is called a quadratic Bezier curve. It has a single control point. And I want to put a disclaimer here. I often mix these two terms up uh, because quadratic to me seems like there's four and in the previous one you have four different points but the quadratic is the one with the three items here. So later in the talk if I you're thinking to yourself, did he mean to say quadratic curve here? I probably misspoke. So in your mind, just do a silent search and replace uh, for the right term, and things will probably make more sense to you. So that was three, con two control points, one control point. Uh, there's also a special case if you have zero control points. You get a linear curve, also known as a straight line. Uh, you can go the other way. You can have higher order. Bezier curves. Uh, this is a fifth order Bezier curve. But the most common ones are the quad curve and the cubic one. And these are also the two types of curves that are supported by Apple's frameworks. And the quadratic one, for example, is great for doing line smoothing. So if you have a jagged line, you want to make it more smooth. We're going to look about that more about that uh, later in the talk. So if you're yearning for some more math behind Bezier curves, there's this great free online book. It's about 70 pages long that goes into great detail about all the math and anything else you can think about, and then some regarding Bezier curves. Uh, and I'll be posting this presentation uh, later on so you don't have to jot down all the URLs at this point. So now, how many of you feel like you have a better grasp of the concepts behind busy air curves? Okay, a little bit of improvement. So now we have the kind of the theory behind the uh, UI, Bez the Bezier paths, or sorry, Be Bezier curves. Let's talk about code. And the class that Apple uses in iOS is called UI Bezier Path. And the reason why it's called path and not curve is because a UI Bezier Path can hold multiple Bezier curves in it. And those curves can be joined to a single line or they can be totally disjointed. The class doesn't really care. So let's start simple by drawing some uh, straight lines. So first we initialize our UI Bezier path object, and then we set the first drawing command, which is move to, and we're gonna to move to a specific point on our screen. And then we can add a line from that point to a new point, and then add a second line, and then finally do a close to make it a uh, closed area. So this is, class is really like a small little drawing program in itself, where you issue these different commands. And it's kind of similar to if you've seen these uh, tutorial learn how to program for kids. You have like these little turtle graphics that keep move, moving around. Busier path, you're kind of 80% there writing such a program. Uh, so if you visualize this, these uh, commands up here, it will draw a triangle kind of like that. UI Busier path also has a convenience initializers. So you can create rectangles, you can do rounded rectangles, you can do circles, you can do arcs, ovals. Those are all very easy to do uh, just with a single initializer on UI Bezier path. And I've created a storyboard, sorry, a playground for you that you can play around with these initializers and see how they work on screen. You can also apply a dash pattern to a path. It doesn't have to be a straight line. It can be any complex uh, path. And at the, the first part is the same as before. We create the path, we move to, add line to, 
uh, we set a line width so there's something uh, visual to see. Uh, the new part is the line pattern. So a line pattern is an array of CG floats. And it's like on, off, on, off. So here we have 20 points of the line being on and then 10 points of the line being off. Now it hasn't, doesn't have to be just two items. It could be a long array. So you can have a more complex pattern. You can do some Morse code using this if you want to. And then you just set that line dash pattern onto the path and you draw it and it will look something like that at the bottom. Maybe you want to do a dotted line. By default, when you draw a Bezier path, the ends of the path have a line cap style that's called but. Basically, it just ends straight up. Uh, the last line of code here, you see line cap style set to round. That will make the end of the path uh, be a half circle. OK, so enough about straight lines. Let's actually look at some real Bezier curves and how do we create those. And for that, we're going to tempt the demigods and do a live playground. OK, so this is a fairly standard playground. Uh, we want to import UI kit. We want to import playground support. Um, I've created my own subclass of uh, UI view. And then I instantiate it. I set the background color to white, so these drawing is just easier to see. And then I set my view as a live view. Now the reason I do this is I want the view to have a coordinate system that matches what I actually see on a, my iPhone device. So I want the origin to be top left. And over on the right here, I do have the assistant view open. So if you open this playground yourself and you don't see anything, make sure you get the assistant view open here, otherwise uh, the playground will not be as much fun. So let's start looking at the code. The reason why I wanted to uh, override, sorry, a subclass UI view is because I want to override the draw rec method so something can be drawn on the screen. And first I'm going to draw a quad curve. I have a starting point, I have an end point, and a single control point. So I just create the curve, move to, and here's the command to add a quad curve. So starting at my point, my current point, go to the end point and use one control point. I want to set line width. And Bezier paths don't have color information or any texture information in them. They just describe the geometrical shape. So as I'm drawing this, I need to set the color I want to draw with. So uh, inside my draw rec method, I set, uh, in this case, blue, and do a set stroke. And let's stroke it. And magic happens, and we have a curve over there on the right-hand side. Now I have a little helper method here that will illustrate what the different, what the control points are, the starting point, and the end point, and the control point. And if we eyeball that, and we see actually that the, the math and the visual representation actually check out. So that was the uh, quad curve. Let's go down and look at the, uh, the cubic curve. So here we again have a start point, end point, and for this one we need two control points. And the uh, method there is add curve, takes two control points. We set a stroke, and then we draw it. And we get that. And again, let's display the control points for that one. And again, that seems to check out. And like I said, we can have multiple curves added to a single Bezier path. So in this case, I'm going to draw two Bezier curves. They're going to be attached to each other. So for that, I have a starting point and an end point for the first line. I have two control points. Uh, the second line, the start point, is going to be the end point of the first line. And then I have two control points for that. 
I'm going to add my curves and then stroke them and we get that nice little curve. And the way I line this up is that I made it so that they seem joined together. And when we put these control points, we'll see how that worked out. So you see this second control point over here is horizontal. And then when I add the other line control point, you see those are in a straight line. So when those are lined up, it will be a continuous line. So if those were at an angle, you will have a uh, little knee on the line there, which may be what you want, but if you want to have a smooth curve, you want to make sure that they, they line up in that direction. Um, oh, let me also point out one thing here. You can do these little um, visualizers in here. But you notice something that they're flipped. So Xcode is a Mac application. Mac has X and Y coordinates origin bottom left. iOS has a top left. So that's why I wanted to create this extra view so that if you're doing this playground, you got this nice little curve and now I've got it perfect, let me put it in my app. You copy your code in your app and all of a sudden your graphics are upside down. That's not good. Uh, so that's a little trick to uh, make it work. Uh, another note here, I'm running Xcode 821. In Xcode 831, uh, you can't preview curves like this. It's a, it's a bug in Xcode. I haven't checked it in the latest betas of 9, so I'm, I'm not sure what happens there. Okay, so this is drawing curves in our playground. Let's go back to our presentation. Um, so, first a shout out to our Mac developers in the audience. Hi, John. Uh, so in this busy air path is the precursor to UI busy air path. So that existed before iOS came out. And when Apple created UI busy air path, uh, they modernized the API a little bit, uh, as they do. And of course, they make some subtle changes. So I wanted to point out two things here. In this busy air path, when you're doing arcs and circles, expect angles expressed in degrees. The more modern way to do angles is, of course, gradients, which is what UI busy air path does. Now, the evil thing is that the parameter name is angle in both classes, and the type is CG float. So if you just copy and code between the two and you actually don't read the documentation, uh, your curves will probably look different from what you expect them to if you're passing in degrees when the code is expecting gradients or vice versa. Um, another thing that the NS Bezier path allows you to do is access the elements of the path. So you can get at an existing and single element, um, and they drop that from UI Bezier path. Now, it's fairly unusual that you want to need to go into the Bezier path object and figure out what all the different uh, subpaths are. Uh, for example, UI Bezier path does implement NS coding, so it's easy to serialize it if you want to save it to disk, for example. Um, but I had an example where I needed to draw the curve and make it appear as if you're drawing it in real time. So for that reason, I needed to extract all the different subpaths and draw them one by one and using a timer to make it appear as, as it was drawing in real time. So for that, there's nice, this nice little extension. I, I'm not going to take credit for this. This is a blog post by uh, Ole Begemann. Uh, and the topic was actually see callbacks in Swift, but he used UI Busy Air Path that as an example. Now this code here uses uh, unsafe mutable raw pointers, which always makes me nervous. Um, I've tried this code, it works great, um, but I'm not going to try to explain it. Uh, there's, go to this blog post and uh, he will go into great detail of how this works. Okay, so now we've seen the various different components of what a busier path is, how we can use the UI busier path object to express it and draw it. And now let's do, do something more practical. Let's uh, create a simple drawing app. And uh, let's begin in Touches Began. 
So we want to override touches began. We want to call super. We want to have a little boiler code to so make sure that we have actually have a, a UI touch object. And then we want to get the point, the location on the screen for this touch. And I have a little helper method here. All that does is creates a new UI Bezier path object and adds it to an array that's on the instance of our view controller. So one of the main selling features of this uh, drawing app is that we can draw one more than one line on the screen. So that's why we have an array where we can keep all our different paths on it. So a new path, after it's created the Bezier path object, add it to the array, it returns that path, and then we're gonna do a move to, to the point. So this is in touches began, so this is the beginning of our drawing, so we just wanna to move to that point. And then we get to a callback in touches moved after the user's finger has moved. We have the same boilerplate code at the top. We get the point, and then we call current path, which is a helper method that basically returns the last uh, UI Bezier path object. And I'm gonna add a line from the previous point to this new point. Now in this uh, MVP version of our drawing program, we're just gonna do straight lines. So we're drawing a straight line from the previous point to this point. And now we need to have it uh, display on screen. So we're gonna call set need display. And if any of you recoil in horror when you see set needs display call without any parameters, um, what's actually gonna happen here is it's gonna refresh the entire screen. And if we refresh the entire screen, every time we get into touches moved, that's not gonna be a great performance. But we're gonna fix that a little bit later. Uh, but for now, we just want to make sure that draw rect is being called after we have added our line to our Bezier path, so we actually see it on screen. And we get to draw rect. Again, we set the stroke color, and then we iterate through our array of paths, and we stroke them. And there we have a drawing program in about a dozen lines of code. Now, our current implementation is uh, fairly naive. And as I mentioned, there's a problem here in the touches moved where we're calling set needs display, refreshing the entire screen. So let's see how we can improve that. So say that I'm drawing this line on the screen and this orange part here is the last point that I've drawn. I don't need to redraw that entire path every time because it doesn't change. So all I want to do is draw, need to draw is that little orange part. So if I can just figure out the rectangle of that part and pass that in to set the needs display, it's just gonna refresh that part of the screen and things are gonna be much better. Now before we look at the code for that, let's uh, talk about the concept of a path versus a stroke. So UI Bezier path has this idealized path which has like a zero width, which is that path line in the center. When you draw it on screen, we're gonna stroke it with a line width. And that line width is gonna extend on both sides of that path. So say for example that you have a view that's 100 by 100 points and you want to draw a rectangle inside it and the rectangle is a UI Bezier path it has a width of 100, that view is gonna clip half the drawing because half of the path is gonna be drawn outside. You might not even notice that because it's still gonna look like a rectangle. Uh, but if you're doing a rounded rect, you're gonna notice that the corners are gonna look very funny because the full corners will be drawn but the sides are gonna be clipped. So we have to take that into consideration when we calculate that rectangle that we saw earlier that for that little orange part. So let's see how that looks like in code. So again, we're in touches moved. This part, top part is the same, and then we want to calculate the rectangle to refresh. Um, so we want to get the previous point, and we can do that from the current path, which is our UI Bezier path object. It has an attribute called current point, so that's the last point that was added to that path. We want to ask the Bezier path object what's the line width, 
and then we calculate the, the rectangle. So we pass in the previous point and the current point, and we create a rectangle from that. And next is a little trick I picked up somewhere that using the inset by method of CG rect. So inset by, you can pass in a delta x and delta y. And in my case, I'm going to pass in negative values, which is going to make the resulting rectangle slightly larger. And you'll notice here I'm passing in line width. Uh, you might think you want to do line width divided by 2, because that's really what you need to extend the rectangle width. Uh, but I'm thinking, by the time I've done line width divided by 2, and then I round it up to a whole pixel, the performance of that versus drawing a few more extra pixels in draw rect is probably a wash. So code like this looks a bit cleaner, so that's what I'm going to stick with. And then I'm going to add the line to my current path, and then at the bottom, I call set needs display just with this refresh rect. And that's going to be much more performant. So let's see what we can do, what that looks like. So here's a uh, little drawing program that uh, I use to try the different path, uh, parameters of a UI based here path object. And I'll post the source code for this as well. So I can just draw lines here. And if I turn on this switch, it's going to show me the draw rect. So as I'm drawing here, you can see all those little red rectangles. I see the hard to see on this big screen. Uh, if I'm drawing fast, they become larger. If I draw s slowly, they're going to be smaller. So only that little rectangle is being refreshed on the screen as I'm drawing, which makes things a lot more efficient. <coughs> And while I'm in this uh, application, before I switch back to presentation, um, we're doing straight lines. So if I draw a curve here, you can see it's somewhat jagged. And what we're going to do is we're going to add in the functionality to use uh, Bezier curves to make this curve much smoother like that. So let's go back to the code and see how we can do that. So if you're doing an application where you want to capture signatures or you want somebody to hand draw uh, text, having the lines be jagged like this is very, it doesn't look very pretty. So let's look at a playground of how we can do a line smoothing algorithm. Oh, another trick about playgrounds, if they don't refresh, and in this case, we're doing lots of graphics, so we want the graphics to refresh. Um, we got this little button down here at the bottom left, the play stop button. If things don't refresh, you click that a couple of times, and hopefully it will trigger your graphics drawing. So here we have a little path at the top right. It's quite jagged. Um, it's purposely exaggerated. You probably won't get points that uh, separated when somebody's drawing uh, on an iPad. Um, but it will illustrate our point here. So at the top here, we've just got all those different points. We create a straight path and stroke it. Uh, nothing new there. Now let's try to draw a using a uh, busier path to make this path look more smooth. So I'm going to first draw the curve. And you see this blue curve here. It starts at the first point in the uh, gray graph. It starts out going to the top point there. And then it curves off down to what looks like the uh, fourth point. And if we display the uh, control points, First, we can see this is a quad curve. It's got a single control point. And the control point I'm using is the second point in the graph. So I'm actually not drawing through that point. I'm just using it as a control point. And then I'm going to draw another curve, starting from that end point, going towards the next point in the gray graph, 
and then vectoring off towards the last, last point. And then again, you can see I'm using that last bottom part as a control point. And then we need to do something at the end. And depending on if you have an odd or even number of points here left, uh, you could do a full curve. Or in this case, I just need to do a uh, straight line to the last point. So now we have this curve that is smoothed out compared to those original points. And as you can see, they don't actually go through the original points that the user drew on the screen. Now, if you're having a drawing program, these points are going to be fractions of an inch apart, not a feet, foot apart like we see on this big screen. So the user is probably not going to notice that we didn't go through exactly those points. They're just going to see, oh, this line looks much smoother, and I'm a great artist because I can draw nice smooth lines. There are other smoothing algorithms. So the one I used here is great for the use case of a drawing program. But in many cases, you actually want to go through the points. Um, one of my favorite uh, weather apps draws this very nice line uh, for the following hours or days where you go, the line goes through each temperature point. Now that graph would be pretty useless if the line went through some nice middle point and actually didn't hit the temperature points that was trying to illustrate. Um, so, for that particular use case, you would have to pick a, a different smoothing algorithm. Here, here are a couple ones, a cosine interpolation, cubic Hermite splines, or a very popular one, one is called catmull rom splines, which makes a very visually pleasing curve. But picking an algorithm here is more art than science. It really depends on your data set. The Kapman rom splines, for example, depending on how the points are, and if, in some cases if they're too close together, you'll get kinks in the line. You can even get a loop. And if you get a loop in your temperature graph, I'm not quite sure what that means. Maybe it's a tornado coming or something. So research the different algorithms and pick one that fits your data. Let's talk a little bit about the CA shape layer. So earlier we tried to optimize our draw rect method. So we want to make sure that we draw, at, do as little work as possible inside draw rect because you want your performance to be as high as possible. So the best way to draw, optimize draw rect is to not have it at all. And we can do that with CA shape layers. Now the good thing with CA shape layer is that you can initialize it or set the path of a shape layer from a UI Bezier path. So at the top here, we have our standard UI Bezier path. In this case, it's a rounded rect. We create our CI shape layer. We set the path from our rounded rect path. And CI shape layer is an old style API, so it wants uh, core graphic parameters. So we just do .cg path. And later on, when we set colors, we do .cg color. Uh, easy enough. We set the line width on the shape layer, it's going to ignore whatever line width you've set in the UI Bezier path. And you set the color, both the fill color if you want that, and the stroke color on the shape layer. Remember previously we did that in draw rect in the drawing algorithm, but here we set it directly on the CA shape layer. And then finally we just add the shape layer as a sub layer to the layer of the view that we want to display it. And that's all we need to do. After this, iOS will take care of rendering it, refreshing it, whenever it needs to be done. There's not a whole lot of information out there about uh, CA shape layer, but there's a great website called CA layer, and uh, the author had the CA shape layer in depth part one article uh, about a year ago. Highly recommend that if you're looking into a CA shape layer. Unfortunately, part two has never materialized, uh, but uh, it's a good starting point. Okay, so now we've got our drawing program. Let's start adding some support for Apple Pencil.
The first part is to uh, detect if an Apple Pencil is being used. And there's no official way to detect if an iPad Pencil is paired with the iPad. And you need to make sure that your application works both with and without Apple Pencil. You can't make an Apple Pencil only app. Apple will not approve that. Uh, if you search online, you can probably find some code uh, where people do heroic efforts to iterate through the Bluetooth stack to find a device that has a name that looks like something that could be an Apple Pencil that's currently paired with the iPad. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that. But what we can do is in each UI touch object, there's a new attribute called type. And if we set to stylus, then we knew that that touch came from, from an Apple Pencil. Any of those called stylus, it's specific to Apple Pencil. So if we have a third party stylus, uh, it's that's going to report as being just a finger touch and not stylus. And we can use this to do some extra palm rejection, for example. So if you receive an event or a touch point, say in the bottom corner of your screen that came from a finger, and shortly thereafter you see another point, touch point in the middle of the screen coming from the Apple Pencil, you can probably deduce what the user did was plop down their hand like this on the screen and then put the, finger, the pencil down on the screen, and we can ignore that first touch point from the, from the palm. Another thing that the Apple Pencil and the iPad Pro combination does is uh, coalesced touches. So this is basic touch points that are between your regular touch points. Now the interesting thing with this is that they're not delivered as callbacks to touches moved for each one of those points. Uh, I'm guessing the overhead might be too much to call the method every time. And in some cases you don't need all those extra touch points. Uh, but we're doing a drawing program, so we want to have as much precision, as many touch points as we can get. So what we do is we call the coalesced touches method on the event that's being passed in, and we pass in the touch, and we get an array of coalesced touches back. So what I usually do is I create an array at the beginning of touches moved. It's an array of UI touch objects. And I look to see, okay, do I have any coalesced touches? If I do, then I add those to my all touches array. If there are no coalesced touches, it could be because you're not using Pencil or iPad Pro, or they were not reported, I just add that single one touch to my all touches, and then later on in my code, I just operate on that array. The next thing is uh, predicted touches. So we want to make sure that we keep up with the user moving across the screen with the Apple Pencil. Because if there's a lag, the line is a little bit behind the pencil tip, it draw, destroys the drawing illusion. It makes it very difficult to make detailed drawings. And no matter what you do, there's going to be some delay from the event, the hardware on the iPad picking up where the pencil is, reporting up through the iOS, coming back to you, you doing your processing, draw rect is being called, and then the line is actually drawn. You can do all you want to optimize that, but there's always going to be some delay. So what Apple does is they try to predict where the next touch is going to come. So if I'm drawing this blue line here, and I've added, ended up on that last blue dot, iOS is going to say, hmm, I think the user's going to go here next. So iOS will send you those two orange touch points as predicted touches. Now the user hasn't moved their pencil there yet but Apple thinks that you will. But haha, we went in a different direction. So iOS recognizes, oh, that's not good. We're gonna discard those predicted touches and we're gonna predict we're gonna go here next. The important thing with predicted touches is that you want to use those for display purposes only. You want to display it on the screen to make it look like you are keeping up with the pencil. But you wanna, don't want to add those touches to your drawing model because these are not real touches yet. And in code, it looks very similar to what we did before with the coalesced touches. Uh, we get into, we have a method on the event called predicted touches. We get an array back. And we want to store these predicted, create a Bezier path just for these predicted touches and draw that separately. Like I said, we don't want to add it to our array of UI Bezier path that we had before.
So we are running a little bit short on time, so I'm going to show you in the example application the altitude and azimuth uh, features. So altitude is the angle of your pencil. So you can angle your pencil like this. If it's perpendicular to your, or in line with your screen, it's the angle is zero. And this way it's 90 degrees or pi divided by two radians. And we could use that, say we want to simulate a uh, pencil. So let's, uh, if I draw like this, and then I angle it, you see the width of that becomes a little bit wider. So that's one way you could use the angle. You can also have the azimuth angle, which is the rotation like this. And if you again want to simulate a pencil, if you're drawing like this, it's going to be a wide path. If you're drawing like that, following the pencil in line, it's going to be a thinner path. Uh, another feature is, or another attribute that's new from that with pencil is called touch force. So how how much I press on the pencil. So if I draw like this, and then if I go press hard, we'll make a thicker line. And this is the stylus only. So if I draw with my Apple Pencil, it will pick up that, but it will not pick up any touch events from, from my finger. Uh, predicted touches are actually very hard to see on this bigger screen, so I'm going to skip over that. But uh, coalesce touches. So if I do coalesce touches and a straight line, you'll notice that there's so many points coming back here that you actually don't see much of the jaggedness anymore. But if you're doing a drawing program, you want to make sure it works for uh, not just users with an Apple Pencil, you want it to work for people who have just fingers or an older iPad as well. So that's why you want to use the uh, Bezier Path tool that we talked about earlier for some line smoothing. So finally, let me show you another app. And this is the reason why I went down this whole rabbit hole of learning about UI Bezier Path. I always wanted to learn how to draw. So when you get like a book on how to learn how to draw, you have, okay, here's a, draw this oval, draw this next oval, and draw this thing, and then magic happens, and now you have a dragon. It's like, wait a minute, there was a few steps that you skipped over. And I can understand that when you have a physical book that you can't make it 1,000 pages long, right, to detail every step. But we don't have that limitation for, with an application. So here you can see the line being drawn, and I can just follow that line. And when it's detected that I finished drawing it, it's going to draw the next one for me. And if I draw way over here, it's going to say, well, that was not good enough. You were meant to draw over here. So that's my uh, passion project at the moment that I'm working on. Thank you very much for coming.